what I've done quite a lot of in Africa to try and understand the constraints that they face, because it's, it's all very well from the outside to say, you know, oh God, they're hopeless, but much more useful to try to understand from the inside what the problems are. Hello, everybody. Today, I had a conversation with Joe Studwell. Joe Studwell is an economist, a writer, a researcher, who wrote three very important books in the early 2000s. The China Dream in 2002, Asian Godfather in 2007, and How Asia Works in 2013. I was very impressed when I read How Asia Works uh, in about 2015 or so. And many things that I gained from reading that book, I still remember today. And I wanted to go back to Joe Studwell and ask him what he thought or what he thinks, how we should assess the developments taking place in Asia today. And what was also interesting was that he is now uh, spending a lot of time uh, in Africa building uh, a book uh, that captures uh, the African revolution that is underway right now. I was very impressed by the fact that you actually started your own um, you know, research business. Uh, at the same time, there's a huge, very strong journalistic quality in, in your writing, which is you have a feel of the ground, you've been inquiring with people in the know, and then, and then you add your own instincts to that. So I just want to get a sense of who are you? Uh, you know, uh, where did you grow up? What were your influencing, um, you know, what were the influences in your life uh, and, and uh, that took you to writing those books that you did? I grew up in the UK, um, went to do my undergraduate in the UK. About 18 months after that, moved to Hong Kong for a couple of years and then moved to Beijing for eight years. So that was the 90s. In 97, I started the company that you mentioned, Dragonomics, the um, the research business, and I did that for a decade. I then sold my equity to a company called Gavkal, a French company. And I, it's quite a substantial business now because Gavkal was already a substantial business. And I think it's still called Gavkal Dragonomics. So I did that. And then I'd written The China Dream, which was really about the gold rush in the 90s into China. And that was published in, I think, 2001. And I'd written the Asian Godfathers book. It's a book about Southeast Asia. And I just used the stories of the tycoons to get people interested in the book because I thought otherwise it would be hard to, to get a lot of people to read a book about Southeast Asia, whereas China was always fashionable. So I did that. When I was a journalist in the 90s, before, in the period before I started Dragonomics, I, I did quite a lot of magazine work traveling to Southeast Asia, although I was based in Beijing, but, but I didn't speak any Chinese when I arrived in, in China. So while I was learning, um, I did a lot of work in Southeast Asia where I, I could speak English. So I went on and then I wrote How Asia Works, which was really a sort of summation of everything that I'd learned in the region. You know, I said with that book that I wanted to explain the region and do it in 250 pages. So I think there's about 70 pages of end notes. I kind of cheated, but, it, but the book itself is 250 pages. By that point, I was back in the UK in Cambridge. After How Asia Works, I did a PhD and where I looked at how come manufacturing companies in China learned, how they learned technologies. And then after that, I got an offer of some research funds if I would do essentially a how Asia works for Africa. And the last four years, that's what I've been doing. And I'm about 70% of the way through the manuscript. What year was uh, the China book uh, from learning to earning or rather, you, you've not turned it into a book yet, the, your PhD. Uh, uh, you know, I you haven't just... turned it into a book because I, to be honest, by the time I'd finished the PhD, I decided I didn't want to teach. So if it was turned into a book, it would be a a peer-reviewed academic book. There's, it seems to me there's no real point if I don't want to be an academic. Well, there's some value in that. For, I mean, the title itself, uh, From Learning to Earning, the Transition from Manufacturing Catch-Up to Competitiveness at the Global Business Frontier as Pursued in China's Energy Equipment Sector. I, I can think of a lot of people interested in all of those. <laughs> I, I probably when this when the when the Africa manuscript is finished, I might have a think about it. It would take a bit of time, and I wouldn't be getting paid for it. And you know, academic books. The extraordinary system is that academic publishers expect the authors to actually sort of pay for the editing process. Bill Gates said about how Asia works that um, it does a better job than anyone anything else I've read 
of articulating the key roles of agriculture and development. And I echo that actually, because um, um, I saw, um, you know, great scholarship, um, you know, and inquiry and, and uh, discipline and putting it back, putting it together. How have you, how has your thinking changed, you think, uh, uh, in all of this time? Uh, where are you now? Are you repeating in Africa what you saw in, in Southeast Asia? Uh, or, you know, are there new themes that you uh, started to look at? I mean, I think what struck me in Africa is that has worked in the couple of African countries that have so far achieved accelerated development. Well, three, I suppose, Mauritius, Botswana, and Ethiopia, prior to the recent horrific civil war. The lessons are just the same. It's about getting household agriculture moving. It's about having a manufacturing sector. And it's about a degree of financial repression around those things. I mean, Botswana is different because Botswana is a giant diamond mine, in essence. Um, but if you look at Mauritius and you look at Ethiopia, then, you know, the lessons there are just the same. What's different in Africa is context. Um, and it's different, really, in two dimensions. One is that Af I, I would say almost the biggest reason that Africa didn't develop historically is low population density. It, it, Africa just hasn't had enough people until now. And the low population density was really a result of the disease burden more than anything. I mean, of course, the export of 13, 14, 15 million slaves didn't help much either. Um, but, you, you know, the, it's important you need population density, which is what East Asia had after the Second World War, because you get down the cost, the unit cost of your infrastructure and you start to get cities as centers of demand, which also provide demand for agriculture and surrounding areas. And there were just there've just been too few people in Africa until um, recently. So it's actually, you know, a good thing that we're well over a billion people in Africa and we'll be at two billion by the end of the uh, two billion 2050 and perhaps four billion at the end of the century. Um, it's really the only part of the world that's seeing significant population growth now. And the other constraint in Africa was just the sort of beginning point in terms of political capacity, and, and but also more generally basic human capital. You know, so in East Asia after the Second World War, between 50 and 70 percent of people were literate and numerate. In many African countries at independence, it was 10 percent. So that just means that you've got to have quite a long period of ed educational catch up um, before you can really get in the game. Because if people aren't literate and numerate, you can't really employ them in the modern economy. What do you think are the uh, operating themes uh, in um, you know, the different parts of Asia, China, Japan, uh, Southeast Asia? Well, I mean, to start with China, I'd say I've been relatively optimistic about China compared to people who think that the, the economic lid is, is going to come off in the last few years. I mean, it's not that I'm a fan of Xi Jinping's leadership. I'm not at all. But my observation is that when you put in place the structures that I describe in How Asia Work, and you have this high yield household agriculture, you have this outsized manufacturing sector, and you have the financial repression which allows you to make mistakes and not pay a price in terms of capital flight and so forth then it's extraordinary how far you will continue to roll forward despite political incompetence i mean the, the example that I, I actually tend to refer to is not in east asia but in italy um where i lived uh for a period i mean italy had a, a land reform in the 50s it had industrial policy to push manufacturing. It had the financial repression and the capital controls. And that economy just continued to grow and grow until the mid-1980s. In 1985, it was bigger than the UK economy, um, despite the most extraordinary political incompetence and corruption. So I, I think that's the lesson that I would um, take away. Of course, you can then go into a very long period of decline at a certain point, which is what subsequently happened to Italy. But you know, I, I think don't underestimate how far it rolls forward before it stops. So my expectation with China is that China can grow at, at 5%, which is a good growth rate when you're at $10,000 GDP per capita, you know, perhaps for another decade. The problem with 
China, you know, does come from this rather xenophobic, insular government that Xi Jinping is leading. Um, I mean, you're probably aware yourself that, you know, a lot of foreigners have left China and are leaving China. I don't think that's a great thing uh, at all. China has been a surprisingly cosmopolitan place through its development. Probably China and Taiwan would be the two most cosmopolitan of the fast growth countries. I think, you know, Chinese people are quite welcoming of, of foreigners. Um, but if you create an environment that they just don't want to be there, then that's not positive. And also, I mean, longer term, I mean, if you look at the demographic modeling, China's 1.4 billion people, and there are, you know, even the UN uh, at, at the extreme estimates that it could be 700 million people by the end of the century. So China's going to need an immigration, I think. But I suppose my, my best guess there would be that like the other fast growth autocracies, um, South Korea and Taiwan, that at some point Xi Jinping or whoever comes after him gets pushed out and there'll be a political transition. But of course, none of us knows when that will happen. And I, in many ways, many of the things he's done, I think, are out of fear that that moment is coming. Do you think China is there uh, in terms of holding the narrative that they're, they're creating today? And obviously, in some critical areas, the most obvious would be semiconductors. They are absolutely not at the technological frontier. They are in some manufacturing businesses, but even there, I mean, even if you look at something like wind turbines, then you actually find that little technical components that make a difference in the performance of a wind turbine, they're actually being produced in Denmark. They're not being produced in China. So, no, I, I don't think, I mean, it's unsurprising that they're not at the technological frontier because they haven't been going for long enough. And so... Yeah, I mean, the confrontation that they have with the United States is will be negative because uh, no one has ever put their finger in Uncle Sam's eye and not regretted it. And they've got themselves in a situation now where both sides of the political aisle in Washington are, you know... A united one, one point, <laughs> which is... To, united you know, against China and sometimes in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a rather aggressive fashion. Um, your thoughts on Japan? Absolutely. I mean, you know... Normally, you see the Japanese aggregate growth rate is miserably low or, you know, close to zero. But if you look at it in per capita terms with a, with a shrinking population, there is more income per person. So, yes, I mean, life in Japan isn't as bad as people like to think. And this super disciplined conformist society where people work together, um, they do have an awful lot of debt that, you know, UK had an awful lot of debt, similar amount of debt after the Napoleonic Wars, and you know we got through it too. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I love going to Japan because it's so foreign, really. Um, you know, I, I can't think of anywhere more foreign in the world because it's it's such an insular society. There's so little immigration. I mean, when you get into rural Japan, you just you, you feel like you're on a different planet. I mean, a, a different planet with very friendly people, but, you know, I don't speak Japanese. So, you know, the best I can do is to try is to, is to try and read the Chinese characters in the language and work out what's going on. But I think that going forward, um, I mean, there have been a number of reforms that have been made over the last um, 20 years. The economy is less rigid than it was. I mean, I don't think the Japanese are, are terribly unhappy and, um, you know, the country will just sort of roll forward, but they will have to find um, technological solutions to a shrinking labour force if they if they don't plan to have more more immigration, which it seems that they don't. I was just wondering whether you, you saw something about the, the, the essential nature of Japanese society that makes it able to hold together that way. Well, I mean, I, th I, I think the you know, just the, the rule following and the conformity in, in Japanese culture counts for a lot. I mean, in that sense, they, they're the kind of cultural opposite of the Chinese. The Chinese are sort of grains of sand. Um, and yeah, it's, it is extraordinary, the difference in that, in that respect. Southeast Asia. Well, in Southeast Asia, I mean, so the, the most exciting country from an economic perspective is certainly Vietnam, because it's the one that's doing what China and Japan and Taiwan and South Korea did that's still in, you know, in an earlier 
phase. It all seems to be going pretty well. Agriculture is super productive. Um, manufacturing is upgrading. You know, I mean, that corridor from, from Hanoi to Haiphong, I think Samsung's making all its phones there, but the, the Vietnamese are doing stuff themselves as well. The financial repression model is the same as the one that everybody else used. Um, the protection given to domestic manufacturers, I think the US will let them do it just because they're, they're a useful political ally or critical political ally in the region. So yeah, I think Vietnam's all all good. I mean, I first went there in I think 1992, and it was a proper third world country, and it's it's not that anymore. So Vietnam, good. You know, the regime, if you like, that I that I'm fond of or like is is Jokowi in uh, in in Indonesia. I think he's been a good a good leader. He's a well, why do you hmm? call him a regime. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Why do you call him a regime? Why do why do you call Jokowi? Oh, exactly. Well, he's no, he's not. He's a he's he's a democratically elected leader. Um, I just mean uh, when I say regime, I think what I mean is is the government that he's put together and he's got it doing more um, than previous Indonesian governments have got done. I, I suspect people might look back and think he's he's he he was the best post independence leader, but it's probably a little early to to say that. I mean, he, he, he's done some work on, on agriculture, nothing fundamental, but he's you know, applied himself there. He's got infrastructure, construction moving faster. And in terms of manufacturing, um, you know, he's demanded that more value is added within Indonesia to a lot of commodities that are produced. You know, foreign commodities companies don't like it, but I think he's doing exactly the right thing. Um, it's not a it's not a, a, an original Jokowi idea because of course you've got to give credit to Suharto um, because under him um, the plywood indus industry grew up because he, he he decided to stop the export of raw logs. But Jokowi is applying it across a number of of sectors. The interesting thing is um, you know if you take the Indo Indonesian presidents you know they've had several now um, you know in succession and so has the philippines in fact when marcos jr became president um you know a lot of the western media was like oh the, you know here we go marcos again and so on and and the fact that we we even forget who the previous presidents are uh, tells you that uh, democracy has become you know uh, quite uh, robust uh, in these countries uh, wouldn't you say that? Uh, and and yes, have you? I think I think you're absolutely right. And um, and, the, and there's a similar trajectory in in quite a number of African countries that I'm writing about. And that's that it, it, and it's very positive. But you don't, I think, want to overstate what has happened in the Philippines. I mean, you still have a a very selfish and dysfunctional political elite. Um, you still have very significant levels of poverty in the country. You still have, you know, 20% of GDP coming from remittances, you know, so why is that? <laughs> it's not because they've created a great economy that 20% of GDP comes from, uh, from remittances. You know, the Philippines remains the, the least um, compelling of the, of the nine major economies, if you like, in, in East Asia. Where I would say has surprised me more on the upside is Thailand. You know, they made some effort with agriculture, no land reform, but you know they they supported farmers with with fertilizer and so forth. They didn't run a domestic industrial policy with any effectiveness, but they did run a very good policy for export processors for multinational companies coming in. So if you look at something like automotive, you know it is all foreign companies, but the Thais have made it happen in a way that the multinationals don't disappear as labor costs rise they've actually sort of bedded down an industry there and in in other sectors and then you know they've built up a very substantial tourism sector which operates because of the climate year round i think thailand has done a bit better than perhaps i would have expected what i would say about malaysia is um right now i would say that i'm 
I'm not terribly optimistic. I'm not a fan of Anwar. I think that he's too tainted by his own association with the United Malays National Organization. And I don't think he's really got uh, a policy formula for the country. I don't think he really thinks in those in those terms. Um, but it's good to see a, a change of government. However, you know, one one can see it sort of bouncing back in the other direction. But I mean, Malaysians are very educated people. Um, you know, I, I always love the fact that you have this this mixed Indian Chinese and Malay population because I, I you know I love these sort of cosmopolitan environments. People, you know, generally do get on with each other. Um, there are some things that were done in the past, like the electronics sector, um, you know, which continues to to run well. There are good entrepreneurs. So, you know, I, I, I suppose the thing is, you you just look at Malaysia and you, you just think it could be so much more. Um, and of course, you know, it's able to suck up all this oil and gas money, which makes the state look better than it is, really. One interesting theme that it just struck me as you were speaking um, is the is the arrival of capital into the agricultural uh, world, you know, from everywhere from Japan to uh, Australia, uh, which is the, the small farmer is getting credit. Or are you aware of, um, you know, how uh, money has changed uh, agriculture in, in a lot of Asia? Well, uh, no, I mean, obviously the last four years I've been working on, on Africa, but I mean, what I'd say is that the, you know, the financing of, of farmers and actual farming work has traditionally functioned best with local credit cooperatives um, that need to be pretty strict and disciplined in getting the money back. I don't know the detail of what's going on now, but it may well be that the general move in East Asia in the direction of consumer finance, well, in Southeast Asia, it was all, always consumer finance, is what is leaving farmers carrying a lot of um, of debt and that and that the lending isn't really related to agriculture at all. For the sake of completeness, uh, what is your take on India? Well, I mean, I never followed India as closely. I suppose in the 90s, I did write one long report comparing India with China and India didn't come out very well at all. My shorthand for how poorly post-independence India performed in policy terms and political terms is that, you know, with the same more or less the same population as China now, the Indian economy is about a quarter of the size, which is not impressive. I think that Modi began, has begun to get his hands around some things, get more done. I mean, you know, I did meet some of Modi's people a couple of years ago, and they were they're impressive in terms of, you know, having clear objectives and, and timetables and all the rest of it. So I'm an economic fan perhaps of Modi, but I, I do not like his brand of extreme Hindu nationalism, um, you know, in a country with a large number of other ethnicities who are made very uncomfortable by some of the things that he and his followers come out with. If you were to uh, pick a theme that, that captures um, an idea about Asia today, what, what would that be? Or maybe several themes? Well, I think Asia for me today is, is really about politics, because I think that the, the basic economic policy choices have been made. And, and once you've gone a long way down your road, you can't quickly make the road go in another direction. You know, the story in Asia today is, is, is a political one, and it doesn't matter whether it's Thailand and the role of the monarchy and the military, or it's Malaysia and the role of UMNO, or, or it's China, and how, how a transition to greater pluralism is going to take place. There is increasing uh, plurality in, in the political landscape in a lot of the Asian countries. Um, you know, wouldn't you say that? And, um, you know, do you see that as, a, as, a, as an indication of deepening uh, of political um, structures and so on? Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. <clears throat> it's a, a, a symptomatic of political maturation. But, you know, the Thai military is not finished. I'm not sure that UMNO is finished. I had to pick in the region the countries that have made the most political progress in the last 10 years. Certainly Indonesia, South 
Korea, Taiwan. I mean, political maturation in Taiwan has been extraordinary. And Japan a little bit. You know, in the time I've been involved in, in East Asia, so much has changed. I, I, you know, one of the reasons that, that I decided to take on the Africa thing was there isn't really any extreme poverty in East Asia anymore. There isn't much in South Asia. Who are the interesting personalities that, that jump out into, into your mind? And it, I'm not talking about the Xi Jinping's and the, um, and the Modi's of the world, but, but um, maybe business people um, and people you think that are worth watching. Oh, it's a difficult one. I mean, I, I think there are loads of interesting business people. Um, there are interesting people in manufacturing, people I've known for 30 years in Indonesia who are doing interesting things. Uh, I, you know, I find some of the tech companies very interesting. Um, you know, business like C in, um, in Southeast Asia. Um, but equally, I think that the Chinese tech companies are going to to, to bounce back, you know, and I think they've they've got so much cash and so much capability that uh, they'll continue to do very interesting things. I mean, a business like Tencent, loads of interesting business stuff. The only the only the only thing for me, I suppose, is that well, I mean, I do still meet a fair number of business people, but as time has gone on, I've become more and more interested in the challenges that governments in um, developing countries face in trying to do positive things for their populations. So I spent, I, I've, I, I found that all very kind of interesting and that's what I've done quite a lot of in, 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 in Africa to try and understand the constraints that they face. Because it's, it's all very well from the outside to say, you know, oh God, they're hopeless. Um, but it, 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 much more useful to try to understand from the inside what the problems are. Rwanda doesn't seem to have popped up in your in in your description. So, what's your take on Rwanda? Kagame has uh, achieved a lot, but he's an absolutely terrifying individual. Um, you know, and he he regularly has people he doesn't like assassinated. So it's quite hard to know what to say about him. But I mean, Rwanda's economic progress, yes, you know they've. And they're doing all, they're doing the right things. I mean, they they are really focusing on the household agriculture. They've got some manufacturing in there, and uh, the, well, the finance is much more orthodox, which I think is problematic for them. But they see themselves as potentially a manufacturer for most obviously the east of DRC, um, because the east of DRC is so far from the. Atlantic coast and is really kind of interlocked with with Rwanda economically um, and they you know I mean he's a, he's a curious guy he has a lot of an awful lot of um, women who work for him in senior roles it's a bit like Gaddafi I mean they keep getting you know different international agencies to base themselves in in Kigali and they're very good at sort of getting he's you know he's built this big very nice actually conference center and they you know it seems to be used quite a lot a very singapore approach uh, you know it's more like a regional hub uh, type of approach it's very singapore but, but you're right i mean and that's the model that he most refers to that's what he is thinking that um rwanda can be and i suppose that he's you know and if you think of the pap i mean the reason it's still in power I think, for me is because it's always been so good at co-opting you know all the talented people in the population who want to go into government and and i think you know kagame does a similar similar thing so now for a writer like you to to sort of expand on things that you've understood about the chinese when you lived in china and now you see them in africa uh, what are your, you know, top most uh, thoughts that you know that you think about when you when you see this in Africa or in any emerging country? My observation with China and Africa has been first and foremost, foremost that it's overwhelmingly commercial engagement. It's not, it's not politically driven. You know, Ch China followed the model, built surplus manufacturing capacity, and needs to sell it. So they're selling it in Africa because that's the place with the demand. And it's just as the, the Japanese sold their surplus capacity in Southeast Asia and the Koreans sold their surplus capacity 
in the Middle East in the 80s when there was a lot of oil money around. So uh, there's no cunning political plan here to co-opt the African continent. And what you see on the ground is that the deals that the Chinese do depend on the political environment in the country in which they do it. So if you're Namibia or your Kenya, you do deals for infrastructure with Chinese companies and they bring in tons of laborers. If you're Ethiopia, you de do deals for Chinese infrastructure and you tell them they're not bringing laborers, they're going to use your people and train them. So that's got nothing to do with the Chinese. That's what the, you know, that's the, the, the about your deal, your deal. Whether, whether, well, yeah, whether the locals have got their heads screwed on or whether they're more interested in some earning versus perhaps, you know, getting a kickback for the job, which undoubtedly goes on. But again, I don't think the Chinese walk through the door and the first thing they offer is a is a brown envelope. Um, it happens usually because um, Some, it's yeah. asked. You know, I mean, anything you want to do in a country like Kenya, the first thing you're asked is what's in it for me by the Kenyan government person. So um, there's that. Overall, I'd say that Chinese engagement in Africa has been very positive um, in the same way that Chinese manufacturing has been positive for the whole world because they have just cut the cost by often 60 or 70 percent. You know, I mean, when I was doing my PhD, I looked at the cost reductions in all kinds of sectors. And, you know, compared to world prices, the Chinese have got, for instance, the price of steel or cement in the domestic market down by about 70 percent in real terms compared with where it was, you know, a decade or so earlier. And they've done a similar thing in Africa. I mean, people are getting roads, I suppose would be the single biggest thing, at a cost that was unthinkable 20 years ago. And a lot of that is because the Chinese in construction, having done so much at home, have developed new low-cost techniques for all kinds of things, um, you know, for pouring concrete without having to build, a, you know, I can't remember now, but someone was talking me through all kinds of things. An engineer was talking me through all kinds of things he'd seen the, the Chinese do that he'd never seen before and saying, wow, it's, it's just incredible. It, and it doesn't come from them being more intelligent than anybody else. It just comes from them having done so much of this in the development of China. What do you think are the major themes that hold out uh, in Africa today that we need to spend, we need to be mindful of? Well, I think one thing I said in, in How Asia Works was that East Asia had set the record for the range of outcomes in its development. You know, so you go from basket case countries like Myanmar to China or Japan. I think that Africa will take the record for a range of outcomes because, I mean, there are proper intractable basket case countries. But at the same time, there are other countries where Politicians are beginning to apply themselves in some way. They've been applying themselves for some time. Populations are more educated. Um, ethnic tension is reduced. The ethnic problem in Africa is largely an outcome of, of low population density, because it was always an, a part of the world, whereas an ethnic group that fell out with an ethnic group could just move because there was always land available. You know, if you compare that with Western Europe through history, Western Europe developed through war. It was about one ethnicity killing another or beating up another in order to exert political supremacy. I mean, like the English did to the Welsh and the Scots and the Irish. That didn't really happen in Africa. So they've got to go around the ethnic problem in a non-violent way. I mean, it's not always non-violent because they've had a lot of civil wars, but you know, hopefully in most countries they find a non-violent way around ethnic difference. And that's beginning, beginning, beginning to happen in some places. I just think there'll be a huge range of outcomes, but that's not the end of the world. I mean, we're going to see some good news stories. It won't all be bad news. You're saying that Africa is un was underpopulated and people could poof around. Um, I had not, it not, had not struck me that way, but you're right. Colonialism, dismantling colonialism, doesn't that um, theme, um, you know, work in your mind in terms of what needs to be done to be dismantled and, and what about colonialism has been good and should be uh, held together. Yeah, I mean, the main impact of colonialism in Africa, which was essentially done at the lowest possible cost in most countries, was that it reinforced local pre-modern practice. 
So, you know, you just put a, a gunboat behind a chief and you tell the chief that he can do whatever he wants so long as he maintains peace. And so it was in that sense, it was a kind of a develop, political development retarding um, impact that colonialism had. It wasn't the same in in every country, because, of course, you have the kind of white colonies, white settler colonies as well, where it's a little bit different. But in most countries, that's that's how it was. And, you know, again, that just goes to what I was saying earlier about Africa beginning its development with a, a level of political capital that was completely different to East Asia. I mean, if you, you know, you look at Korea or Japan or China, you've got centuries, if not thousands of years of um national political rule. China developed a critical mass in, in manufacturing that it didn't have before. What do you think the world will look like um, in the next, uh, you know, uh, three to five years, um, given these tensions between the US and China right now, uh, and, the, and their influence on the developing world that you cover? The only things we can say with certainty are that the efforts of the United States to prevent China getting cutting edge technology in many areas and particularly in semiconductors, I don't think that's going to change. It's not going to change until there's political pluralism in China. The Chinese will try to go around that. They'll be a lot more competent at going around that than the Russians, but I'm not sure that they'll be able to get what they really want. How Africa would look like, you know, three to five years from now, for example, because of this, this, um, these new dynamics that didn't exist in Southeast Asia uh, in the 1990s, in, well into the 2000s, actually. I, mean, I think that African countries will have relationships with both the United States and China, because if they if they have any sense, they'll see both as sources of capital and both as as markets and you know i mean i mean if you think of one example of ethiopia i mean they are the second uh, biggest debtor to china in africa after angola but the money has been spent wisely for the most part hydropower projects roads railways they have a close relationship with the chinese the regular Prime ministerial meetings with, with, with Xi Jinping at different, in different fora. But at the same time, they also have a close relationship with the United States. And the United States offers them, for example, um, AGOA, the, the, the trade agreement that gives tariff free access for garments. So they're trying to build out a manufacturing sector. And that access to the US market is critical for early entrants. You know, and at the same time, they let the U.S. fly drones out of Ethiopia. So they don't think that it's that you have to make a choice. And I think they're right. Um, and I think that's what most African countries do and, and will do. I mean, they take the view that the confrontation between China and the U.S. is not not their problem, that they can be friends with both. And I'll be looking forward to what you have to write uh, on Africa. That's great. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Thank you, Joe. Take care. Here's a man who had written books uh, which were incredibly uh, perceptive, um, intuitive, um, and um, you know, with a solid feel of the ground uh, in terms of uh, uh, the factors that went into uh, the progress or the regress of the different Asian economies. And in order to do that, you really need to be dispassionate. And Joe Stadwell is a dispassionate um, uh, research writer. But at another level, uh, I saw that he carried a lot of his prejudices with him. Um, you know, saying that uh, Joko Widodo's we don't, we don't uh, Jokowi's um, um, government was a regime. Uh, I thought that was, um, you know, um, totally, um, you know, offline. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, off the radar because uh, that's you can't call uh, the Indonesian government today uh, as being a regime by any stretch of the imagination. In fact. We need to congratulate Indonesia for having made its transition into a democracy um, over so many years. And they paid a huge price in making that transition uh, and that it's a functioning democracy today. Um, you know, I thought that, you know, um, like Thailand, the automobile industry, um, saying that it's just foreign dominated and so on. Um, 
obviously had not captured a feel of uh, the supporting industries that have developed in Thailand uh, around the, the major um, foreign manufacturers, um, you know, and, and uh, maturing of the Thai uh, industrial um, capacity, um, you know, and, and then uh, the fact that Thailand has got a dysfunctional government um, actually belies the the possibility or, you know, the, the fact that we need to examine a little bit more uh, the civil service in Thailand, which very clearly has been functioning, um, you know, very professionally uh, and laying the foundation uh, for a um, competitive economy, despite uh, the politics. Uh, and you can say that in terms of the story of several Asian countries, that the politics um, you know, uh, it's dramatic, it's uh, dysfunctional and so on, but there is a layer uh, of uh, civil service uh, or civil structure uh, that is becoming stronger uh, in its own right. Uh, and that I thought is something that we need to uh, take into account. Um, and the same thing can be said of Malaysia, which is a country that has had, um, you know, a, a, a tremendous turmoil um, in making the transition out of a corrupt uh, political base um, and where it is today. And so uh, in as much as, you know, um, any two people can have an opinion on someone like Anwar Ibrahim, um, the fact that he, um, you know, represents uh, the ideal of a, of a people from the grassroots, um, you know, um, wanting to see this change, um, that's where the story is, you know. Um, and then when I asked uh, Joe Stadwell about colonialism, uh, I was quite surprised uh, with the uh, comment that um, colonialism was all, just about all about putting guns into the hands of uh, warring tribes. Um, I thought that statement uh, was colonialism in itself. Okay, um, now uh, you know the different African countries. Um, are uh, going through their history all over again today to discover their own conflict um, resolution mechanisms that existed uh, pre-colonial times, right? And, and then uh, the countries that are able to make those um, connections uh, find that, you know, there, there, there is something in their past uh, that they can go back to uh, in order to stabilize their uh, borders and so on. In fact, stabilizing borders uh, has been um, the battle cry of a number of nationalists uh, in Africa recently, right? So, uh, so I thought that um, you know, expressing prejudicial um, opinions uh, was anathema to the great books that he was writing. So I'm not sure, um, you know, where that comes from, and I'm sure he disciplines his thinking uh, in the writing process, um, and that. Uh, you know, that his ideas get carried. And I am just looking forward to his African books. Uh, in fact, by reading uh, the book that he is going to be publishing on Africa uh, will help me understand um, some of the um, elements that made Asia successful in its time. Uh, and then look out for those elements in Africa going forward. So these were the top of mind uh, thoughts that came to my mind at the end of the conversation. Uh, happy to have uh, comments from anyone, um, and uh, you know it doesn't have to be uh, for or against uh, Joe Stadwell or any of the observations that I've met. But the purpose of these conversations uh, is to get a sense from the people who have had access uh, in terms of what they see uh, are the drivers, the the elements uh, that make uh, all the different economies tick. Um, and I do think that today uh, we need to see the transitions in politics uh, as being uh, important, but then also pay attention to uh, the social structure that underlies uh, that politics today going forward. Okay, um, my own opinions are expressed in other videos where I'm not talking to, um, you know, um, people with original ideas like Joe Stadwell and others. So, uh, you know, follow me on other platforms uh, to see what I think.